أين أما بعد قال الله تعالى في كتابه الجليل أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا I would like in the beginning to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this truly a blessing for me to be among all of you this afternoon. Um, uh, this is my second or third time to be in this madrasa, but I think this is my first time speaking to the parents. And the topic that I'm going to talk today is about preparing future generation, uh, particularly in our context as Muslims, Americans, be you immigrants or non-immigrants. I hope that these steps will be beneficial uh, to all of us. And I'm standing here does not necessarily mean that I am better than any of you because life is a learning process and each one of us is learning to be better in anything including in parenting and as immigrant parents also we must continue learning how to be better parents in this newly adopted country of ours the United States of America. So it is something that we need to continue learning how to deal with our future uh, generations. So it's, uh, I'm not talking only to the parents, right? So, I'm, so we have also students attending. But let me begin by uh, saying this. Um, these children who are sitting in front of us and I'm addressing your parents. These are amanat. These are trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Holy Quran generally, in a general sense, that this life is a trust. Okay, we have, we have been given this life as a whole as a trust. We have been the trust T. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we, ha we are supposedly to be trustworthy to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have trust on our shoulder. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anfal, بَعْدَ أَنْ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَخُونُ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولُ وَتَخُونُ أَمَانَاتِكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ All believers do not betray Allah and the messenger and betray not the trust that Allah has entrusted you knowingly and then Allah the next in the next ayah mentions innama amwalukum wa auladukum fitna indeed your possessions your wealth and your progeny your children are but a trial for you so in one hand these are trials and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using the word fitna in Arabic language it has two heads it can be ibtila it can be really a musibah it can be really a ni'mah a favor so it depends how you are going to direct this trust you direct them to the to the way of musibah bala or you bring them to the way of ni'mah. They have two directions. And it is up to the parents to decide. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Holy Quran that ignoring the future of our generations, in fact, is a betrayal. Betrayal. Betraying Allah, betraying the messenger, and betraying the trust of Allah on our shoulder. So take this very seriously because truly this is a huge responsibility both here in this dunya and the next. I, mention, I would like to mention once again because not all of you attended my lecture yesterday morning in the center. But a long time ago, six, seven years back, 
I got a call from someone that I never spoken to her anymore. From this area, um, I forgot either it's in Maryland or Virginia or Washington DC. I was an imam at the Islamic Center of New York at the time. And she called me saying that please do help me because my mother is somewhere in Manhattan. And to be precise, there is a home care, elderly home, on 77th Street on the east side of the city. It's a very fancy home care. So I said, what happened to your mother? She said, my mother is very sick. So after some hours, I went to that home and I found her struggling between death and life. She was on Sakratil Mot, on the brink of the death. And nobody was there. So directly I called the office, I said to them, please do call this girl, this lady. And they called her and the response was, uh, I'm sorry, today I'm still busy. The mother is on the brink of the death and the lady is still saying, I'm still busy. To make the story short, the following day, the office of the elderly home called me that she passed away. So I said to them, call the lady, the number that I, I gave you yesterday. They called her and she said, uh, I will be coming tomorrow because I'm still busy today. Her mother passed away, died, and she still, I'm busy. That is the mentality that our kids sometimes having. But this is the reality we are facing. And I mentioned this from, uh, because she, she happened to be an Indonesian lady from Padang, by the way. So those who are from Padang, I don't mean it, but Alhamdulillah, the Padang people are very religious, basically. But it happened to her. Now I got a response from the daughter when she came to New York. I say, why did you call? Where did you get my phone number? She said, I searched you on the internet. So she found my number on the internet. You know, because when, when the people invite me to deliver khutbah, they put my phone on the internet. So it becomes so public. So I showed you on the internet. So I said to her, what your mother said before her death, she said, you know, when I die, please do arrange for my, you know, for my body Islamically, something like that. F my funeral Islamically. So I say, oh, so what is your religion? I say, um, I'm a Muslim. But she doesn't know at all anything about Islam. I asked her, what do you do? She is a business woman married to an American guy. So my brothers and sisters, this is one of the sudden story that I have in mind. And I mentioned the second story also about a Javanese Orang Jawa who passed away just two weeks ago. Married to a Hispanic lady, divorced long time, they had two, three kids, and what happened, the whole kids became Christians, following the mothers. So when the father died, I asked the friend of this father, please persuade the kids that we are going to arrange his, their father, Janaza Islamically. The children rejected. He is our father, we are in the sad moment, do not bother us. You can pray in your mosque, but do not involve in our affairs. This is our family affairs. That is just a set of stories that we have in our community. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So brothers and sisters, this is truly a great, a big opportunity, a, great, a big responsibility. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obligates upon all of us, Ya alladhina amanu, ku, protect yourselves and your family from the hellfire. But the question is how to do this? How to do this? It's not easy. Easy to say, difficult to do. Because we are living in a different environment. I don't know, I think the majority of the kids are going to the public schools. And in public schools, of course, they have their own environments. There are some positives, but there are some negative environments. We are so happy that our children are taught to be open-minded, to be brave in debating sometimes, they have freedom to discuss, that's good. Islam wants our kids to be independent in thinking. But sometimes they are not taught to be responsible enough, especially in terms of moral responsibility. So it is very important that home is truly not only a place to sleep, because when you talk about home in Arabic language, number one, it is baitun. Baitun means the place you are doing mabit to sleep, put down, you know, lay down your head and sleep. That's why you have mabit in Mina, sleeping for a while. 
half night or one night. It's called Mabit. It's just called Baytun in Arabic language. But more importantly, Baytun in Arabic language means Sakan. And Sakan means the place where you obtain tranquility, peace, joy, happiness. And it is simply difficult to happen if your kids are not involved or is, are not be involved. Not only your kids sometimes between the husband and wife too, there is no, always there is the quarrel and fight, you know. There is no peace between the husband and the wife. While our home is supposed to be the Sakan Maskan, the place where we obtain our tranquility, joy and peace. So brothers and sisters, what then we do? I, I, because I don't want to be so long, I just wanted to mention some steps. Number one, the importance of revisiting our vision. Vision. What does it mean vision? To make it simple, more simple, this is what we know in, Ar in Arabic language, in our, in our Islamic terminology, niyat. So it is niyatul haya. You know, unfortunately, sometimes we, when we Muslims talk about niyat, our understanding of niyat is limited to the niyat of salat. When you want to pray, you have dunia. For Shafi'i people, for Indonesian Muslim, even we utter it. We say, Nawaitu salat al dhuhri arba'a raka'atin imaman for imam, ma'muman for ma'mum, lillahi ta'ala. Even we mention that. That is our concern about niyat. Niyat for us is just the niyat for saum. Nawaitu sawma ghadin, etc., etc. Niyat for us is just ihram doing hajj and umrah. The most important and essential niyat for the Muslims is to understand the niyat of the haya, the niyat of our life as a whole. And this is very crucial. We need to ask these questions every time, every moment. The moment you wake up in the morning, ask this question. For, for what? That I'm going to live my life. I wake up this morning, now I'm going to leave my house, going to my work, for what? To gain some money? Yes, nothing wrong with that. Your family needs support. But if that is the only intention, then that is it. At the end, that's what you have. So niyat, basically, is really shaping the future, the, the color of your life. Because it's really shaping the way you conduct your life. Including, and this is for young people, it's too young to, to, to listen to this, including when you have that intention, vision, then you have to think about future life partner. From that moment, basically, you think about, if I marry this woman, if I accepted the proposal of this man, what kind of children are I going to have in the future? For those who have married already, don't think about this. <laughs> it's already happened. You, not, you just need to reshape it again, to correct it again. Okay? But for my young brothers and sisters, this is very crucial. This is very important because you don't, if you don't have correct vision for what you're going to marry, what is the purpose of your marriage, building a family, then you are thinking about when I have a child, I'm going to send him to her to Harvard University to become the best lawyer, to become senator, to become a congresswoman or man. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. For my young brothers and sisters here, my kids become like Ilhan Omar, even better than Ilhan Omar or Rashida Talib. But not only that, we have even bigger niyat, bigger purpose than that. And our niyat is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to enter into the jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what does it mean? Graduating from Harvard University, but you don't know the deen. You are going to be happy for 30 years, 40 years maybe, and then you die, and then after that what? Ask that question. So niyat is very important. It began by when we are looking for possible partners in life. It's very important. It's, now parents, it's not easy for a young brothers and sisters to find partners, especially in this kind of environment. That is why it has become the responsibility of the family as the whole and even the community as a whole. And I hope that within the community, there must be a, a program um, how you call that in English? Match, huh? Matrimonial service. There's nothing wrong with that. Help your children, help your boys, help your girls finding their spouses. That's why we have Islamic camp is good. Send them to Islamic camp. Who knows? 
Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open their heart to fall in love with someone and then they are so courageous enough to talk to the girl, for example, talk to the dad, say, Dad, I want you to talk to the, to the father of this boy. The girl is nothing wrong with that. Khadija proposed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do not be shy if you know someone who is good for you, talk to your father for your own good future. Okay? So this is number one. Plan, and also future life partner. Plan and family management. When you have a correct need, then you are going to plan and then manage your family accordingly. Accordingly. Okay? This is number one. Make it short. Number two. I mentioned that as an opening. Responsibility. Again, is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number two. It can be for or against you. There's a story, I don't know if this story is justified. That someone died, le leaving behind irresponsible children. Because he didn't take care of his children, Islamically. No education, they never taught them how to pray, to read Quran. So the children grow up irresponsible. So when he, his children died, let's say one of the child, one of the children, the angel wanted to take him to the hellfire. And he, while he was dragged to the hellfire, he was screaming. And he said, oh Allah, you are not just. Allah knows, of course. But sometimes Allah wanted to make it as a self-proof. He said, what happened? He said, why you take me to hellfire while your fathers are in, in, in Jannah, in paradise? And Allah says, because your father is responsible, your father is righteous, your father was praying. You didn't do it. Say, Allah, I didn't know. Your father didn't teach you? Of course, Allah knew. He said, no. And at the end of the day, the decision is that take the father and him to the hellfire. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Holy Quran. Inna min azwajikum wa awladikum aduun lakum, aduun lakum. Among your children and your spouses can be enemies for you can be an enemy for you. And that is true enemy in the day of judgment. So you can imagine you are going to the, to the, to the paradise and because of the children has become a, a, um, against you and say, no, no, I want my father also to come to, to the hellfire. That is the real enemy. If your children leave you here, don't give you any money, ignore it in this dunya, that is only for 20 years, 30 years, you die, inshallah, done. But in, general, in, in the hellfire, it might be for a long, long time. So take this very seriously. It, they, they can be for or against you. This is number two. Number three. Don't be late. And especially, you know, in Indonesia, I think for those who are Indonesians, I think for uh, my brothers and sisters who are immigrants also who came to this country lately. You know, sometimes our parents uh, didn't care that much. You know, because the environment is already okay. We can go to the masjid, mashallah. We have ustaz can teach us Quran. We can listen to the azan all the times. The azan reminds us that we are Muslims. We have the responsibility to pray. But here in America, no one reminds our kids. But more importantly, remember this one. We are living in a very technologically advanced society. And our kids are so matured very quickly. Three years. They can play their own iPad. You know why sometimes parents cannot, do not know how to do with the iPad. So they are becoming so easy, so quick in maturity. And so do not be late in teaching them. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Muru subiyanakum bis salati inda sab'in. Command your children to pray when they are seven. The, the meaning of seven, you know, imagine about Arabia in the, in the 7th century, in the 6th century. Maybe 7 at a time is just like now 2 or 3 years old. So it means not 1, 2, 3, 7, no. It means as earlier as possible. And that's the meaning of don't be late. In fact, to be honest, the process of education began from the very beginning. You know, I'm sorry to mention this in the presence of our kids, but even when you have a relation with a husband and a wife, and you don't even remember to make dua, Rasulullah says, shaitan has been involved there. 
That's what Rasulullah said. I did not say that. But Rasulullah said it. It means the process had been there since the very beginning of the journey. So do not be late, my brothers and sisters. The, the Quran says, Qu anfusakum. Ya alladhina amanu, Qu anfusakum. The word Qu comes from waqa, yaqi, wiqayatun. It's an Arabic language, of course, Quran Arabic. Qu anfusakum means waqa, yaqi, wiqaya. What is the meaning of wiqaya? Wiqaya means preventive measures. You have to take preventive measures. The problem is sometimes we begin to feel that we need to talk to our kids when they begin to say father mother this is my own business you don't have nothing to do with my life and then we say oh my god i'm late now it's the time for me to, to sit down and talk to them or to him or to her that's what the problem why because we didn't do any prevention earlier so it is very important that we must not be late as early as possible my brothers and sisters and if you see the process of of um, uh, from the birth the aqika until the khitan for the boys you know all these are process of education when your child is is born and then you make azan and iqama this is a process of education don't think that it's not a process when our sisters are pregnant okay and it is among the recommendation of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that you recite quran especially surah maryam surah yusuf with an intention that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them imitating Maryam or Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. Why do you recite the Holy Quran? Do you think the fetus, the babies inside of the womb, the wombs can listen? Allah make them listen into the Quran. And it's a part of that process of educating them as early as possible. This is number three. Number four, our children. You know, if you, then, if you just ask them, they need this. They need some time. They need attention. A long time ago, Newsweek magazine wrote an article under the title, A Lonely Generation. Uh, sorry, An Angry Generation. It says that American generation are angry generation. And one of the, the important reasons why American generation are angry generation because they did not get attention and time enough from their parents. Especially for those mothers who are working out there, sometimes they do not even breastfeed their kids. There are many reasons why they don't want to breastfeed their kids. Sometimes because they feel you know, so busy working in you know, a professional career, whatever. But sometimes also because of beauty reason. So that's why they don't want to breastfeed the kids. But believe me, Breastfeeding the kid is not only nourishing them physically, but more importantly, emotionally and psychologically. You know, many years back, um, Al Gore, when he wanted to run for presidency here in the state, he said he wanted to pay the mothers who breastfeeding the kids, but he was not elected. He, got, he didn't get elected, by the way, because he knew that it is very important for the mother to breastfeed the kid. You know, my sisters, you have to know that the most intimate moment between you and your child is the moment when you breastfeed them. It's the most intimate moment. It is not only that you give them milk, we mean physical milk, no, but it is an emotional nourishment, a psychological nourishment. That's why particularly Allah mentioned in the Holy Quran, what Allah say, when the doomsday happens, in the day of judgment, the day of judgment happens. The Quran says, You will see, I'm sorry, I forgot the ayah. I forgot, by the way. But when the doomsday happens, there are three things that people are going to do. Anybody remember that ayah? Any Hafiz al-Quran here? Hmm? Anybody? Surat, um, uh, if not mistaken, it's Surat al- um, huh? I forgot completely. Number one, you will see the breastfeeding mothers at that time, the breastfeeding mothers are going to throw away their kids. 
because it's so panicking moment so panicking moment so every mother who was who is breastfeeding the kids at that moment is going to throw just away the kids like stone like whatever materials she's not going to care anymore now why this Quran why the Quran mentioned this particular incident the mother throwing away the kids because basically that is a very close moment intimate moment between a mother and a kid and that's why my point here that breastfeeding the kid is very very important for the mother it is a part of attention basically now quality time you don't you know that better than me you go more to the park you go more to the mall you you know play game with your kids sometimes you know just show them that you care you're caring you know I'm including the person that I don't have that much time basically to do that but you need quality time with your kids now number seven brothers and sisters continuity you know the struggle between the right and the wrong between the haq and the batil between the truth and the falsehood continues till the day of judgment that's why Iblis Allah asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make him to make him alive till the day of judgment Rabbi akhirni ila yawmi wa oh Allah make me alive until the day of judgment why because it's con it continues the struggle between the right and the wrong so education also is not an instant you cannot just send your kid once in a week or maybe even going to Pesantren for six months and you feel that he is okay now Islamically it's a continued process it's an ongoing process that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْتَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا command your family your children to pray and be patient on it and the word wasbir is not only wasbir there's a difference between wasbir and wasbir when allah says wasbir it means one time you have to be patient but wasbir means continually continuously a continued process it needs patience all the time and that's why i said number seven it is about the continuity so don't think that you know um, my kids are going to islamic school particularly in america let me just mention this, my brothers and sisters. Uh, yeah. On the day of judgment, you will see every nursing mother. It's closing. Every nursing mother, okay, will be distracted from the child. It means she will throw away the child. It's just like that. Because throw away. It's very panicking moment. Why? Because it's so panicking. And Allah mentioned that with, an, with, 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 uh, with a lesson that we need to learn. That it is the moment of intimate connection between a mother and a child. When you are breastfeeding your kid. Now, coming back to number eight. It is a shared responsibility. Husband and a wife. You know, sometimes her husband is saying, oh, that is my wife's responsibility to take care of my child at home. Or sometimes also say, no, the wife says, no, it's my husband to teach my kid. It is a shared responsibility. That's why husband and wife in Arabic language is called zawj. Zawj means partner. So there must be partnership in educating our children. It is a shared responsibility between a husband and a wife. It's a sure blame later on if you don't take care of that. Okay, this is number number. Uh, uh, the Holy Quran also says, "Garment to one another." Hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lahunna. A man is a garment for the woman. A woman is a garment for the man because that is the shared responsibility here, covering one another. Number nine, brothers and sisters, I just give you one tools to educate our children, and it's very easy, basically. You don't have to bring them even to the weekend school. But you can do it at home. And that is Quran and Salat. Quran and Salat. Particularly Quran and Salat. Why Quran? Because Quran is the foundation of the ilm and the foundation of Iman. Our Iman is not a blind Iman. It is about an understanding. But even just reading to them the Quran, they don't understanding, understand yet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make them understand. Let me just give you an example how Quran can, can impact someone's life. After the September 11, I think you can 
see my YouTube, uh, my video on YouTube, me reading Quran at the Yankee Stadium. There is a, an event called National Prayer for America. So I read the Holy Quran and I tried to beautify my reading as much as I can. And it was, it was aired on national television, so it aired internationally to all over the world. Attended by President Clinton, Hillary Clinton, the senator, then senator at the time, and many other um, figures in America. Three months later, a woman called me from an area called Jamaica, where I live now. And she says, Salam Alaikum. <laughs> you know, if some say, someone says Salam like that, either a non-Muslim friend or a newly reverted friend. Salam Alaikum. Say, Wa Alaikum as -salam. Yes, who is this? She said, this is Tahira. Is this Shamsi Ali? I said, yes, it's me. She said, I've been looking for you for the last three months. This is three months after reading the Quran at the Yankee Stadium. I was surprised. A woman looked for me for the last three months. <laughs> What's wrong? <laughs> so I said, why you look for me for, for three months? She said, because when you read, it, the, read the Holy Quran at the Yankee Stadium, my name was Cynthia, Cynthia Roland. Cynthia Roland. Not Cynthia, Cynthia Roland. But Alhamdulillah, now I'm Tahira Roland. So I said to her, why you change your name? She said, when you read the Holy Quran, I was a Christian. I was watching CNN, and without knowing, she didn't realize why, she was tearing, crying, listening to the Holy Quran. So after listening to the Holy Quran, she went out from her house looking for someone and asked what kind of that book that, that guy read. Someone told her that it's a Muslim book because maybe he doesn't know the name. It's a Muslim book. She went to the, to the library asking for a Muslim book and the librarian gave her Quran, translation of the Holy Quran. What she said to me, I read it for three months. Every night that I read it, after reading it, I felt so peaceful and I sleep well. It's a good advice for you. If you have a lot of problems, buy the big Quran put on your head at night. <laughs> you have sleep good. <laughs> she slept well. And she said, after three months reading the Quran, three months reading the Quran, I could not resist myself to meet Muslims. So he, she went out again and asking the people where I can meet the Muslim. And someone said to her, there is a mosque there, Muslim house of worship there. It's not far from her house. She went to, the, to that place called Ikna, Islamic Circle of America. It's the, uh, the, the head office in, in Jamaica. She went to that place and she became Muslim at Ikna Marcus, at Ikna office. Because Ikna knows me, they gave my number to her. That is just one example, brothers and sisters, that how Quran is so impact, impacting to our human mind, our psychology, our mentality. And if you read it to your kids, this is really a healing. This is number one, Quran. Teach them Quran. Read to them the Holy Quran. Let them learn the Holy Quran. It is very important. It is very important. Secondly, Salat. As Salah. Why Salah? Because it is foundation of the deen. That is the beginning of building connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they cannot pray, they cannot do anything in terms of any things that you have to do in the religion. As Salatu Imadu Deen. It is very important to teach them how to pray. That is number nine. Number ten. This one is very important because brothers no matter what even if you send your kids to an Islamic school if at home it doesn't function as a Muslim family home it is not sufficient so what I'm saying here home must be three M's three M's what is that three M's number one Madrasa, so it's not only a once in a week. Home must be madrasa. Number two, masjid. It doesn't mean that it is not important to go to salatul. I don't mean salatul jamaah here. I'm going to explain about that. And number three, musalla. There is no salat, not musalla, musalla. Tasliya, salla yusalli tasliyatun. And the meaning of tasliya, entertainment. I'm going to explain about. It. So number one, madrasa. Your home must be the real madrasa for your kids. It is not the school. 
Even if you send them to Islamic school, but your own home, there is no teaching. They do not see any knowledge of Islam. They don't listen to anything about Islam. Nothing. It doesn't impact their life. In fact, they, they, they are going to have double standard personality. In the school, they memorize hadith. They memorize dua. They memorize Quran, come back home, nothing. They memorize dua of eating in the school, but coming home, they never listen to the parent even saying, Allahumma barik lana fima razaqtana wa qina adhab nar It doesn't happen. So brothers and sisters, the real madrasa is home. Is home. Again, it's not only madrasa to imam once in a week. It's home. Number two, masjid. Masjid here means the place for you to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word masjid comes from sajada, yasjudu, sujudun, wa sajdatun, wa masjidun. Means the place where you do sujud. And sujud means obedience. The real meaning of sujud is obedience. Walillahi yasjudu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. And to Allah, all in the heaven and earth making sujud mean obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the real place for our kids to, to learn how to obey Allah is a home. They wake up in the morning. Muhammad, did you read dua? Not yet. Please, read dua first. You enter into the room. Muhammad, start, enter into the bathroom by left foot, right? Okay, that's the madrasa at home. Our kids are going to the public schools just running. No, 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 please. Did you say salam to me? The mother will say that. No, I didn't. Please come, come back and say salam to me because I want you to pray for me. That is madrasa, my brothers and sisters. There's a home, as, I mean, obedience, where the kids are practicing Islam. The kids are doing Islamic things. They are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They want to eat, take your hand. Did you read dua? That is obedience at home. And then the third one is musalla with sin, not salt, musalla. Our home must be the center of entertainment for our kids. What does it mean entertainment? It's not lagu dandut. You know lagu dandut? <laughs> it's not rock or pop. Entertainment means something that kids feel, you know, environmentally speaking, feel peace, joy, rest. Sometimes when our kids come home, they feel not easy because their fathers and mothers are fighting. You know, everything is about hectic, no, no salam, no peace. It's so difficult for our kids to stay. And if they don't find this type, type of entertainment at home, they are, go, they are going to go somewhere else to find entertainment. And that's why sometimes our kids, they love even to stay together with their friends until late at night. They don't want to come home because they don't find rest at home. There was there's a problem of home. And that's why my brothers, the third M, a home M, is musalla. Entertain them. Entertain them. By your smiling, the way you talk to them, the way you conduct your connection with the kids between brothers, siblings also. And even the environment, in general environment of the house. You know, how to, to let them feel that this is a peaceful place for me to, to stay. This is number seven. Number eight, community. Community is very important. And that's why I said in my lecture yesterday that Imam is not only a building. It is about members of the community feeling attached. If I would like to say community centers is really the cave, Ashkaf, Ashabul Kafi, the cave of our kids at this time, where they can come and find some protection. So please do continue attach yourself for the kids to the community. That's why I'm still hoping there are young adults who are organizing their activities out there somewhere. It's okay to do organizing activities somewhere else, but feel that you are part of the community. Because feeling a part of the community will protect you as a Muslim, inshallah ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Apa sih bahasa? how you say it in English? Domba. Domba itu akan diterkam kalau menyendiri. Lonely sheep will be attacked by a wolf. But if you are together in congregations, you will not be attacked by the wolf. Okay? So shaitan is very easily coming and attack you if you are alone. 
And that's why the community here is, the, is a group, is a community, is a, a congregation for you to be protected. So community is very important. Now number two, akhirah oriented love before the last one. Now what does it mean akhirah oriented love? This is especially for the parents. Brothers and sisters, we love our family. There is no doubt about that. But this love must be akhirah oriented. What does it mean? In the day of judgment, there are special angels. Their responsibility is only to carry, to carry the thrones of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The thrones of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On daily basis. While carrying the throne, the arash, they make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rabbi wa adkhilhum jannatil adni alladhi wa attahum wa man salaha min abaihim wa azwajihim wa dhurriyatihim. They pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O oh Allah, make them entering into Jannah, their parents, their spouses, and their children. In other words, the angels want us to enter into the Jannah together as one family. You can imagine that you love your kids so much in this dunya. Whatever she or he wants, you buy for him. Wherever he wants to go, you bring him. And then in the day of judgment, when you pass, that's what is called Sarat al-Mustaqim. You pass the Sirat and you look at back. You see your son Abdullah. You see your son Umar. You see your son Uthman. Beginning, Abdullah fall down. In the middle, Umar fall down. And then Uthman fall down. What kind of love that you have? So love must be akhirah oriented. It is not only here in this dunya. Because if you love your kids, and it is only for this dunya, that is temporary love. And I'm sorry, maybe that is just not genuine love. You need to love your kids forever. And it's only happen when that love is akhirah oriented love. Finally, brothers and sisters, don't forget to make dua for your kids, especially the parents here. And I would like to say it's more special for our sisters, the mothers. Because your words, just words, even unintended sometimes, unintended. Any words that come out from your mouth can be du'a for them. Can be bad, can be good. So always prevent yourself from saying bad things about your kid. When you say dog, your kids can become dog. I can be a dog. Monkey, they can become monkey. Not physical. So it's why... My sisters and father also be careful of saying things. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this because this is my own personal experience. You know, um, I used to be a little bit rebellious when I was a kid. Still now. <laughs> okay. I used to fight a lot. So when I came home from the school, my mother, I still remember these words, saying this. May you change one day. This is it. She didn't even say, may Allah change you one day. May you change one day. Semoga dalam bahasa daerah ya, in a local language in Indonesia. Mudah-mudahan kamu bisa berubah suatu hari. Only that. And those words came from her, from her mouth. Possibly that is the beginning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted. And that my father at the end of the, my primary school, he sent me to a divine jail. Divine jail called madrasa. I call it divine jail <laughs> because truly it's a jail for me. I used to fight and in madrasa you have to discipline, you have to wake up early in the morning, reading Quran, listening to the teachers, listening to the ulama, speaking. You know, really it's difficult for me in the beginning. I call it divine jail. My father said, why? Possibly because of what my mother used to say, may you change one day. So please do not hesitate to make dua for your children. Maybe they are not in the high school, it's difficult to talk to them. Especially that we are immigrants, sometimes it's difficult to communicate with our kids who are born and educated here. They have American, American real accent, English, you know. And we have Indonesian English, Spanglish, how you call it? Indonesia English, Spanglish? In English. <laughs> sometimes it's difficult for them to understand. But inshallah, when you make dua, Allah will make them understand. And our dua, let me end with this. Our dua is insha'Allah guaranteed, accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not be doubt about that. 
And let me remind, uh, repeat again the story of this Pakistani doctor. I mentioned this yesterday in my khutbah, uh, my lecture in the morning. A Pakistani doctor one day wanted to visit one area in Pakistan, a remote area that cannot be reached by car. So he rented a helicopter. And the moment the helicopter were on the, on the, in the sky, a trouble came. Very rainy, thunder. So he was forced to land in one of the remote area. Looks like nobody lived in, in that place. So there were three of them forced to get out from the helicopter and try to find some way for sh to shelter themselves from the, from the rains. And they found a very simple house. They knocked the door and there is an old lady opened the door. And she said, what I can do for you, Sheikh, can we just shelter ourselves for a moment? She said, yes, coming in. They entered into that house. The lady gave her some chai, some tea, and some food. And after finishing the food, the rain stops, and the doctor wanted to leave. But before leaving, he stared inside of the house, and he saw a very small baby, a boy, lay down on the floor. So he asked her who that baby is. And the, the old lady says, this is my grandson. The mother died, and the father left him with me. And this kid had been sick for few months, for many months, in fact. And I had been praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me money so that I can bring him to Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan. To a special doctor, that no second doctor, only that doctor can treat him, him can cure him. So the doctor asked, who that doctor is? What is the name? And the lady mentioned his name. What does it mean? His, her dua accepted by Allah in a way that Allah wants that dua to happen. And it is to bring the doctor. Instead of giving her money, Allah brought the doctor to her. So mothers, fathers, don't forget to make dua. Because our dua is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our kids inshallah ta'ala. So these are the points that we have, 13 points. I hope this, uh, these points are useful. Try to implement it as much as we can. And I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our generation, you know, grow them and keep them, inshaAllah, in his path. Alhamdulillah, we still have 10 minutes, maybe one question from the audience. She wanted to ask question. So I wanted to know, how do we express these things to our parents without them feeling disrespected in any way? Say again. How do we tell the 13 commandments that you just said to our parents that like, we feel that they need to do a better job of these without them feeling disrespected? It's not. tell this to the parents without feeling disrespected, without them feeling disrespectful. Oh, okay. You know, listen, listen. You have the right, not only telling this to your parents, even you have the right to say no when your parents ask you to do something that contradicts with the teaching. But there is a difference between saying no and disres being disrespectful. The Holy Quran says, if the parents force you to commit the most severe sin, in the religion. What is the biggest sin in the religion? Anybody knows? Huh? Sure. So if your parents ask you to do shirk, then you have to say no. But the Holy Quran says, karima. Still you have to say no respectfully. So even if you want to tell these parents, nothing wrong with that. If your parents are not here, you go back, you have taken notes, say, my parents, this is what we learned today in the Madrasa Imam. I want you to know this. And you can still talk in the way it is better than me talking because I'm sure that the way you, uh, it, it's easier for you to express to your parents. Okay, so you can still talk to your parents, but remember this kids, respect is always required in communicating with parents. No matter how disagree with you with your parents, disrespect is still a blame on you because your parents are still parents, no matter who they are. Now sometimes we say, you know, my, my mother's in Indonesian language, we call it Chirawet too much, you know. <laughs> uh, my mother is so rewal too much, talking too much. But she is your mother. 
you can still talk to her and say, my mom, I'm so tired, can I do it later on? I have something else to finish. But you do it, you say it respectfully. That's what the Quran wants you to do. The Quran doesn't want you to be, to be, um, to lose your freedom. Even to your parents, you have still freedom to express yourself. But always express yourself with responsibility. And that responsibility means with respect. Okay, so, so nothing wrong to tell them. It's very clear, 13 point. Okay, it's clear? Okay. Bad one. Oh, what happened to the baby that died? What happened to? Oh, the story. The story of Oh, oh. Okay, so the, the Pakistani took the baby to, to his hospital in Islamabad and treated him. And that is the end of the story. I don't know what happened, either he's, he's dying or he, he's alive. But the, the Pakistani doctor then brought not only the baby, but also the grandma. To the to, to Islamabad, to the capital of the country, and treated the baby. Yeah. All right. Anything else? I think it's the last right. Okay. So thank you so very much. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala again protect our kids, and may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala bless us. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.